My mother talked about her dreams as though they were events. Because she never said I dreamed. She said, you know, and I thought, <laughs> if you have no access to the political life or the governmental life or the institutional life of your world, you do reinvent or invent a reliance on religion, magic, something else that's yours. I didn't feel um, the threat of being a woman. I was encouraged by my father to think that way. He thought I was the smartest thing in the world. Me and my sister, he thought we were lovely and sort of charming, but tough. As a young girl, 12 years old, I'm working in somebody's kitchen a couple of hours after school, $2 a week. But I don't know what I'm doing. The woman has equipment I never saw before in my life. I don't really know how to scrub the floors. So she would complain. So I complained to my father. And he says, you don't live there. You live here with your people. Go to work, get your money, and come on home. You don't know what you're doing, learn. You know, it was, it's very important things to be told at that age what your talents are, what your abilities are, and that you are not beholden to somebody else's opinion of you. My sister, who is older than I am, got married when she graduated from high school. She didn't want to go to college. I did. So I went to college. And my father was very proud of that. And my mother was very proud of that. And they promised me they could do it for a year. They said, we only have enough money to do it for one. I said, I only need one, I said. <laughs> then I learned that among white girls of a certain age, that was not common, that they educated the boys. That for a girl to go off to college before the boys was, you know, not unheard of or rare. No, it's entirely different in the black community, it seemed. The fathers pushed the girls to go to college, even if they couldn't send the sons, because the girls, if they went away, could get nurturing jobs, teachers, nurses, some non-threatening thing. If they pushed their men, their boys, they would, you know, want to be promoted. You know, they might get a little hot. You know, they would be in a rivalry and confrontational situation. So that's like the race itself decided how to survive and reproduce itself in levels. Writing for me is the only free place. It's the only place where I'm not doing what somebody else wants or asks or needs. Writing is mine. So winning the Nobel Prize, suddenly I am in a different league not just out there in the world, but in my head. That sort of rivalry within oneself that is not self-generated, but generated outside. The necessity for me to make sure that my work was not somebody else's version of what I should be writing about. Almost all of the African-American women writers that I know um, were very much uninterested in one area of um, the world, which is white men. That frees up a lot. It frees up the imagination because you don't have that gaze, you know. And when I say white men, I don't mean just the character, but I mean the establishment, the reviewers, the publishers, the people who are in control. So once you er erase that, from your canvas, you can really, you can really play. I studied American literature, classical literature, English literature, dramatic literature. All my life it's been in those areas. It's a confluence. You know perfectly well that you're pulling from the rest of the world of books. But what you want to make is this one little place, like the facet of a diamond, just one little shape, and that's where you live, and that's yours. <laughs> <laughs>